Welcome to Highland Park. I'm Joanne Beck, president of the Highland Park Conservancy. The Conservancy is the all-volunteer, not-for-profit partner of Monroe County Department of Parks, which operates and maintains Highland Park, including the Lamberton Conservatory. Highland Park is important as the very first public park in the Rochester and Monroe County Park System. A masterwork of design by Frederick Law Olmsted, a landscape designed and built to express the intrinsic scenic beauty of its site and as a showcase of horticulture and a public space to advance the social ideals shared by Olmsted and the Park Commission for human health and well being social equity, freedom, and happiness. For over 130 years, Highland Park has been a place of extraordinary beauty for everyone to experience every day. In these virtual tours, we'll be exploring the Lamberton Conservatory and the tree and plant collections throughout the park. Our guides include horticultural interpreter Noelle Nagel in the conservatory and Monroe County Park's horticulturist Susan Maney on the seasonal park tours. We hope you enjoy this tour. I look forward to seeing you in the park before too long. Good morning and welcome to Highland Park. My name is Susan Maney and I am the horticulturist for the Monroe County Park System. This beautiful spring morning, we are gonna go on a tree tour. Built in 1911, the Lamberton Conservatory is our starting point today. So we are going to journey through the collection and make stopping points along the way to show you some of the fabulous trees in this park. Let's get started. Before we even cross Reservoir Avenue, I want to point out our Japanese flowering cherries. This collection of cherries has been here for more than 30 years, and there's a collection of Japanese cherries in at least four different varieties. The cherries are not yet open, but if you look down the street, other cherries have been open for a week to 10 days. So depending on the cultivar, that is what is going to be in bloom. This has been an exceptional year in 2021. We had 70 degree weather in early April, the end of March, that sent everything blooming. And then we got cold weather and it's all stopped. So we have things that are blooming together that we wouldn't normally see. Although I'm not exactly sure what normal means anymore. So we're gonna cross Reservoir Avenue and head into the park. Highland Park was developed in 1888 after Elwanger and Barry gave 19 acres to the city of Rochester to form a park system. Along with the acreage, they also gave a collection of trees, which makes Highland Park really rare and unique in the United States because many of these trees were the initial imports from Europe that were collected by Ernest Wilson through the Arnold Arboretum. Meanwhile, I wanna point out that this is an Olmsted Park. An Olmsted Park means that we have beautiful valleys that allow views to come in to focus as you walk along meandering paths. And you're going to see that as we move through. Highland Park was set up as a botanic garden. The trees were planted in collections based on plant family. The first couple of families we'll be walking through is the Magnolia family and the Aeschylus family, which are the horse chestnuts and the buckeyes. This first magnolia that we see is Magnolia lobelii, which is a hybrid. And you'll notice the star-shaped blossoms. It's a cross of the star magnolia, which is the first magnolia to bloom in the spring about mid-April. As we continue, you'll see other members of the magnolia family. The tulip poplar, you'll see one good young example right here, a tall straight tree that's a native forest tree in the United States. And then you're going to see an older version, which is not so tall and straight, is more craggly, and is just starting to leaf out. So even though it's in the same family as the magnolia, the tulip poplar really won't come into its glory until late May. This tunnel that was created was one of the oldest trees in the park. It actually pre-existed the park. It was a black oak. When it fell in a Labor Day windstorm, instead of cutting it down, we created this tunnel 
and then we planted a new black oak next to it. And because Highland Park is such an old park, we don't have an opportunity for a lot of new plantings. What we tend to do is replace the plantings that were here. While we're standing here, this is an opportunity to see the very young palmate foliage of the horse chestnuts in the Aeschylus family. And these will bloom in early June or late May, but they will bloom with the leaves. Many of our spring flowering plants bloom before the leaves emerge, and you'll see examples of that as we go along. I don't even know if you can see it, the pink of that tree right there. Those are the red buds. The red buds are just starting to emerge. As I said, a lot of the spring flowering trees will flower before the leaves, and that's certainly true of the red buds. Moving into the magnolia collection, you'll see this big magnolia that's in bloom now, that is the Slaven Snowy Magnolia. The Slaven Snowy Magnolia is one of the first magnolias to bloom in our collection, and it was hybridized by Barney Slaven, who was the second horticulturist here at Highland Park. Barney Slaven was a self-taught plantsman who worked for the park system for 52 years and is responsible for many, many cultivars of magnolias, lilacs. He developed a lot of fastigiate, meaning upright forms of plants for street trees. Now you see the star magnolias with their white star-shaped petals. These are the saucer magnolias and you can see they're just starting to go into bud. They're this beautiful deep pink to almost maroon color and they will open up with a typical magnolia flower but they will have larger petals and be pink and white. Underneath the magnolia collection, as well as all up this hill in the horse chestnut collection, you'll see what looks like grass, but two weeks ago was a carpet of blue flowers. These two collections are understoried with spring flowering bulbs. First the Cayendoxa, which is a small blue, considered a minor bulb, followed by the Scylla, which is a little taller blue flower that nods. And right now we're at the end of the Scyllas. You know it's a Scylla because it's nodding down. If it's a Cayendoxa, its face would be up and looking at you, and it has a white center. There are also a lot of daffodils planted in this collection. You can see them along the star magnolias. The next feature in Highland Park I want to point out are the two rows of tree peonies. Tree peonies differ from the herbaceous tree peonies in that they have woody stalks and are very long-lived plants. The woody stalks are necessary because the flowers of tree peonies are usually the size of a dinner plate and are quite heavy, so that woody stem helps hold them up. In about 1988-87, the George Eastman Museum were making decisions about restoring their their terrace garden, and these tree peonies were in that garden. They called the heirs of the original donor, her name is Lee Gratwick, and said, what do you want us to do with these tree peonies? And she said, please put them where they can be seen. And that is how they ended up in Highland Park. It's actually the second popular park in this part of New York State. The first is Letchworth, but it's certainly the most popular park in the city. I want to make a stop. This is another magnolia. In the mid-1980s, the Brooklyn Botanic Garden started a hybridization program to expand the color palette of magnolias, and they developed the first yellow magnolia. And this is one of their cultivars. And you can see it's budding up in, as yellow. There's very few that are brilliant yellow, but there are a couple. This is the Crimean linden, and you can see it's a beautiful dome bell jar shape. It comes all the way to the ground, sweeps back up after it has hit the ground, and it has this fabulous underplanting of Scylla. So it's really a tremendous tree. It is one of the legacy trees of Highland Park, and it is a hybrid between the little leaf linden and the European linden. But there's a beautiful little sanctuary right around the trunk that is free of any branches. And when the tree is completely leafed out in the summer, it has wonderful yellow flowers that are very, very fragrant. I do want to point out this row of large, large, large trees. These are our London plane trees. London plane trees are a platinous hybrid between the western and eastern sycamore trees. And you can see they're just starting to leaf out but it's a beautiful time to see the bark of these trees, which is mottled with big patches of white. The London plane trees actually predate the park. 
The reservoir was built in 1867 and the London plane trees were planted soon thereafter. So they were here before this park was developed. They will have big, almost maple-like leaves by the end of May. And their blooms and their seed pods will be evident later in the summer. This is a great example of the age of this park and of some of the trees in it. This is an older saucer magnolia, but you can see, I can stick my hand all the way in here. It has survived even though it is basically hollow, but it continues to thrive because the rest of the tree is getting nourishment in the outer trunks. Here you can see the fading and a little bit of frost damage of these earliest blooming saucer magnolias. But you can also see where the seeds come from. As the petals fall away, all of these are anthers that form seed heads. This is what gets fertilized and then the seeds come from here. We're moving now past the Berberis collection, which are the barberries. This is an extensive collection and I can't even get in here to get to the tags for them because they're an incredibly thorny plant and you have to be very well armed um, with layers of clothing to get into them. The green varieties will have long racemes of yellow flowers in another, oh, probably two to three weeks. They're a couple of weeks beyond the magnolias. Here's another example of the yellow magnolia. This magnolia is actually one of the hybrids from the original yellows that were developed at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. And it's named after the then director, Elizabeth Schatz. So it's a wonderful example and a great plant to have in our collection. Magnolias mostly come from Europe and the Balkans, but there are two native magnolias in our collection. And I wanna show you one because it doesn't come out for another several weeks. This is the Bay Magnolia, Magnolia virginiana. It is a native, particularly in the south. It's at the end of its native range, but it won't start to even flower until the end of May, around Memorial Day, and then it'll leaf out. But if you look into the upper regions of the tree, you can see the tree, the pods of last year's flowers. So there's two of them in this area. So now we are moving into what Highland Park is famous for, our lilac collection. Our lilac collection covers 22 acres. There are about 1,500 shrubs, give or take 30 or 40 every year that die and are replaced, and about 500 varieties and cultivars. The largest and most significant collection in the United States, if not this part of the world. So they are just beginning to, to bloom. You can see them coloring up and the earliest varieties, the hyacinthophloras, have just started to open. So on the reservoir, the north side, it's actually more like the west side, are the collection of lilacs that were developed in Highland Park. John Dunbar introduced 30 varieties, and then more than 100 different varieties were introduced by Dick Phoenicia, Alvin Grant, and Bernie Slavin over the course of their time as the plantsmen of Highland Park. Many, many of these are derivatives of what was introduced in 1963 as the Rochester lilac. Most lilacs have four petals. The Rochester lilac has what's called radial doubling. So not only does it have eight lilacs, sometimes it has another ring of four to have 12 or another ring of 16. They've counted up to 22 petals on a Rochester lilac, and it's been used for hybridizing many other cultivars. It's one of the reasons that Rochester is famous for its lilacs. There are two sentinel trees in the lilac collection. These two very mature Austrian pines. I'm really grateful they're here because if you get into the, the slope of the lilacs, it's kind of hard to figure out where you are. And those two trees help us mark where we are in the park. They've been there since the turn of the 1900s. We believe they were planted about 1906, and they did come from the Arnold Arboretum during a plant exchange that went from the early 1900s until the 1940s, where Wilson would discover plants in China and in Asia, send the seeds and cuttings back to the Arnold Arboretum, which is the Arboretum of Harvard University, and those plants would be distributed to seven to 10 gardens across the United States. And Highland Park's Arboretum was one of the recipients of many of those plants. 
So I'm going to stop and talk about this plant. This is a Stewardia, and you can see it's just coming into leaf. The Stewardia is a Japanese plant, and it's really a four-season plant. First of all, it has beautiful mottled bark. So it's a feature in the wintertime with this beautiful peeling mottled bark. It has these beautiful, very soft petals that come out in the early spring. It is a summer bloomer, so it doesn't bloom until June with white flowers that look very much like a small camellia. And then in the fall, the leaves turn this beautiful burgundy merlot color. So it really is a four season plant. And we have a couple of different varieties I'll share with you. Now, I had talked earlier, I'd shown you a, a smaller, fairly new planting of a Stewardia. This is our oldest Stewardia. This is the Japanese Stewardia, Stewardia pseudocamellia. And you can clearly see this beautiful mottled bark, which is almost muscular in its smoothness. It was vandalized at one point in time, and someone with a knife came along and cut off this beautiful bark. And the tree formed a perfect scar tissue around where the damage was. So this branch died, but the rest of it lived. And if you come a little closer, you'll see that the center of this tree is completely hollow. But enough of the root system is alive to keep it moving. And this tree dates from about the 1920s. It's just a survivor. A couple of other interesting trees that we have that I've never seen anywhere else before I came to the park. This is Discantia fargaceae, and it is an Asian native, and it's just coming into flower now. But what's interesting is it has this clump form, so you can see where other clumps, other stems have died. Um, it has long yellow flowers that'll be out probably in early June. But what makes it really interesting is that in the fall, it has these they call them cucumber-like fruits. They're bright blue and they dangle like this and they really do look like dead fingers. The common name for this plant is dead man's fingers. And if you feel that cucumber-like seed pod, it kind of feels like your fingers, which is just weird, but very cool. There's two of them right here. Beyond us and down this southern facing hill are lilacs. We're still in that 22 acres of lilacs, but along the pathway over the years, former plantsmen have planted this collection of rare and unusual trees. So we're gonna look to the west side now, towards the reservoir, and this is the beginning of our Japanese maple collection, which is extensive. And one of the beautiful trees in this collection is this paper bark maple. The paper bark maple was found by Wilson in China sent to the Arnold Arboretum. And we have a collection of these that originally came from the Arnold Arboretum. But once again, it has this fabulous cinnamon colored bark that exfoliates. You can see the exfoliation and the cinnamon color. The paper bark maple is an unusual maple in that it has three leaflets per leaf. So it's a pinnate leaf. Most of the maples have one big leaf that looks like the Canadian flag. This one has three of those leaves and they're much smaller and it has beautiful fall color. There are probably somewhere close to 3,000 varieties of Japanese maples. We have a small percentage of those. I'm kind of going back and forth across this path, but you'll see this understory of big green leaves. These are the leaves of the autumn crocus, and they come up every spring. As you can see them, it's in, they're in the lily family. They grow for about a month, a month and a half, and then they slowly fade. They never look anything other than like this. They're just green leaves. But in mid-September, all of a sudden, up pops this naked stem with a bright pink flower. It is the autumn blooming crocus. We call them naked ladies because they're pink and they're pretty and they're naked. They have no leaves. Every year, it's, it's kind of a crapshoot of how many of them we actually see. But this collection has been here for a very, very long time. Now we're gonna look at two of more legacy trees in our park. This tree and that tree are a male and a female version of the ginkgo biloba. The ginkgo biloba is the only conifer that doesn't have any scales. It has leaves. And I think that 
The ginkgo leaf is one of the most recognized leaves. It has that fan shape and they are revered in China. After Hiroshima, the first tree that grew and produced foliage was a ginkgo and it was near a temple in Japan. The female is rarely planted because she has droop-like berries in the fall that have an outer covering that contains butyric acid, which is a very foul smelling acid. And when they fall to the ground and start to rot, it's very difficult to be in the vicinity because it smells kind of like vomit. So it's not something that you wanna spend a lot of time being around. But the seed that is inside of that fleshy outer coating is a little bit smaller than an almond. Um, it's ground and used as a paste in a delicacy in China that's used for the New Year celebration. This is a great view of the different plant forms of the Japanese maples. These are older plants, some of them as much as 50 years old. And then the understory right here that you see, this shrubby understory that's just starting to come up, it looks like our horse chestnuts. That's because this is in the Aeschylus family. This is the bottle brush buckeye. It is a shrubby form. It spreads. If it likes where it is, it'll form a colony. So you can see there's a big colony. And what makes the bottle brush buckeye really interesting is that in the height of summer, like July, it forms these big white panicles that really do look like a bottle brush, but they're this big. We have more of the autumn crocus foliage that is the understory to this huge Turkish filbert. And it does produce fruit. And usually you find the pods which have the filbert nut inside. You'll find them in the fall. It's just starting to leaf out. Another plant I want to point out, we might have to get a little closer. This is a Dawn Redwood. We have a really good collection of Dawn Redwoods, including one of the oldest ones in the United States that was planted in 1906. It's on the corner of Goodman and Highland on the southern corner, southeastern corner, um, that came from the original seeds that were sent by the Arnold Arboretum. But this is a deciduous conifer, meaning that its scales fall off. They turn bright yellow and fall to the ground. It's just starting to leaf out now. The Dawn Redwoods, it's Metasequoia glyptostroboides, is its botanical name, is um, an ancient tree and does remarkably well in urban environments. They're actually used as street trees. They get very large, which surprises me. It'd have to be a pretty good sized street but they also grow very quickly. We're coming to the end of the Japanese maple collection, but tucked in here are two interesting Japanese plants in um, the Styrax family. You don't see these very often. Styrax japonica, you will see that they will, they are summer bloomer and they have, in June, they have small white flowers and then that are nodding. Then they form this little berry and they look like little bells. So the common name is Japanese snowbell, but there's two of them. One has variegated foliage here. We stopped and looked at the Turkish filbert, another member of the Coralus family that people will be familiar with, the Harry Lauder's walking stick. It's a very popular landscape plant. This is a red leafed version, Coralus avalana. It's called red dragon. It was developed at Oregon State University and it has burgundy like foliage and this twisting stem. It's, it's a beautiful plant. This one is actually only about eight years old because I planted it when I first got here and it was a two-year-old plant. So it's a pretty quick grower. So this is the beginning of our shrub collection. It's just starting to leaf out. We have a large collection of spirea, a large collection of the thorny rose, hydrangea, nine bark, ketoniaster, the Japanese ilex, and a huge stand of sorbia sorbifolia, which is the false spirea. And those are all still quiet. They're just start coming into bloom now. We're also walking past a very large, mature American holly, which is the triangular shaped tree you see, and coming into two stands of bayberry. Once again, they're not in flower yet, but the bayberry is a 
spreading cluster and you can see it's it's become a huge plot in here this weeping cherry kind of introduces you to we've had to prune it because we take vehicles through here for maintenance but you can see the white blooms the pink blooms the doubles the weeping there are several forms of flowering cherries in this collection it smells fabulous right now we are still above the lilac collection so there are still lilacs just south of us now here's a great example of a weeping cherry and then you can see the sweep of the cherries that come through here. This is the end of the blossom of a cornelian cherry. The cornice moss, the cornelian cherries, are the first plant to bloom in the spring with little tiny yellow flowers. And people think it's forsythia, but it's not. It is the cornice moss because they're little tiny flowers. Forsythia have a much different strap like floral. But this is just at the end of it. If you were here in March, that would be the only thing in bloom. You can't see around the corner because of the way the, the land is conformed, but you know that there's something over there because you can see the color in the bloom. That is part of the genius of the Olmsted design, is that mysterious, you know it's there, but you have to walk that way. It almost draws you into the park. So we're coming to a stand now of another member of the Rose family, which is why it's called Rose Valley, called Amelanchier. And there's a couple of different varieties, the Lavis and the common name is Serviceberry. And they have small white flowers. They're just coming into flower now. Once again, they flower before the leaves come out. It is a native plant. It has little blue berries, bluish red, and the birds love them. It is a native, it's a great pollinator. It's a great plant to have in a migratory space for birds. So we have a big planting of them here, one, two, three, several of them right around this corner. Now this is a stand of Vitex, which as you can see is just bare sticks for now, but come summer it will have these panicles of purple flowers. This is one view, one of our famous legacy trees, the Katsura tree. About three weeks ago this was a pink hue because when the leaves first start to come out, they're bright red. And then as the leaves start to open, they turn into this green color. You can still see the outline of the tree and under it, the snake-like root system that's been bared by multiple people walking over it. This Katsura tree, Katsura japonica, is more than 100 years old. We actually had a birthday for it a couple of years ago. It deserved it. It is a male tree. Katsuras are dioecious trees, so we have a female. She's near the Magnolia Collection. We planted it in Highland Park in 1906, and it did come to us from the Arnold Arboretum. And if you look from this view, you can see the pansy bed. So if you were driving down Highland Avenue and looked at the pansy bed and then looked straight up, you would see our Katsura tree. So we're gonna head into Rose Valley. That's where you see the genius of Olmsted's design probably can't see it. There's a large collection of forsythia further down this path that leads to the corner of Highland and Goodman. This is really kind of the apex of Rose Valley. If you're coming up the path, you're going to make a sharp turn to head up into the collection more. On this side is a shrub collection. The large trees that you see are all pin oaks. There's one, two, three, four of them. And they're just coming into flower if you look at them, these are the flowers of an oak, and then the leaves are just coming out behind the flowers. They're a catkin flower. Here you'll see where the sweeps and the meandering hills draw you in. Directly in front of us is an old Cobus magnolia, this big white tree with a bench in front of it. In the early spring, it is literally carpeted with the blue Cayendoxa. And you'll see several varieties of the flowering cherries. The newer white variety straight ahead of us and the weeping form just to the left of it. The big tree that you see at the top is one of our legacy trees. That is the raisin tree. If you want to take a little walk, we'll walk through Rhododendron Valley. All these paths that are in Highland Park lead to the overlook to the top of the park where the children's pavilion once sat. It's the highest point in Highland Park. It's the reason it's called High Land Park. It's why the reservoir is there. Off to our side, 
we have a collection of viburnum and at this point we're getting to the oldest section of the lilacs where the lilacs that are here some of them were planted as early as 1892 when john dunbar started the collection you can see there's a lilac that's open my guess is it's a hyacintha flora since it's open in april usually the height of our lilac collection is mid to late may now this is a lilac this huge tree this is a tree lilac. This one is Pecanensis. There's also Reticulata. So there are two varieties of tree lilacs, but you can see that it has exfoliating bark on its younger branches. And it does have a flower, but it, it doesn't look like a typical lilac flower, nor does it smell like one. It looks closer to a privet flower. It is a panicle, but it's white and it's not sweet. It's, it's not a sweet scent. Now we're coming to the top of the ridge and you can see a row of oak trees and then we get into conifers which form a shaded dell which is where we have our rhododendron and azalea collection. The conifers drop their needles and they acidify the soil so these ericaceous plants thrive in that acidic soil. The beginning of our rhododendron collection which was greatly expanded under park plantsman Richard Phoenicia for more than 30 years, he hybridized, particularly azaleas, rhododendrons, some lilacs, but azaleas and rhododendrons seem to be his real passion. In this shaded dell, these rhododendrons and azaleas have been thriving. There are also ericaceous plants, such as this lacothoe, and you can see one of the early azaleas is in bloom right now. The rhodes, with their big, beautiful flowers, will probably be closer to the beginning of June. On this side, we have mostly white pines, but you can see there's also hemlocks in here. The eastern hemlock is one of the only conifers that'll grow on a hillside in dry shade. So they're very valuable for this planting. You can imagine what this looks like when it's in full bloom. It's just these big, beautiful flowers that are right in up next to you. More Lakothawi. This is just coming into bloom. You can see its buds coming out now. This is an evergreen, a broadleaf evergreen, as are the rhododendrons. They will stay green all year. They don't look all that great, but they stay green. Now we have more of our paperback maples. There's a series of them planted in sort of in a sinewy ridge here. This one is actually a true rhododendron. This is the PJM rhododendron which is easily available in the trade and you'll find pretty much anywhere that sells plants. And you can see this collection is about to come into bloom. You can see the tight buds. So we are getting to the top of the hill where the overlook is. I wanna take one little brief aside and go down to the Parodia. Here is our memorial rock to Mr. Phoenicia, who was our famous hybridizer and propagator. This is another well-known and fairly common landscape plant the Japanese Andromeda in full bloom now. It loves the ericaceous soil. It does very well in this pine mulched soil. Now this is another magnolia, an interesting magnolia. It's a big leaf, it's the tripetala, but you can see it's barely coming out. The big leaf magnolia doesn't start even sending out their blossoms until usually mid to late May which is almost a full month after the star magnolias bloom. We're in the witch hazel family collection, and you can see these are flowers that have now set seed, but I really came up here to show you this. This is our Parodia persica, which is the Persian ironwood. Once again, this beautiful exfoliating mottled bark, and it's in the Hemimalus family, so it has Hemimalus-like alternate leaves. But what's fascinating to me about this tree is that during the March of 1991 ice storm, this and many other trees in this park were completely decimated. This tree was chainsawed down to the ground. It came back, and here it is. I've always loved this tree because of the beautiful bark. A month ago, you would see little tiny red flowers that are now gone. So it has little tiny red flowers, first thing and they only last a week and then the leaves start to form so it's just a beautiful survivor in highland park it actually the ice storm happened the month after my first child was born and i actually took a chunk because there were still 
trunks on the ground home with me because I was devastated by the fact it was gone. And when I came back 25 years later to work in this park, it was back. So this tree has a special place in my heart. So we're going to actually go up this way and get to the top, which is also another view looking down into Rose Valley. This is a Coosa dogwood, another exfoliating bark, and it is also just coming into flower. The Coosas actually bloom later than the American dogwood. The Coosa dogwood is a Chinese native. This is a whole understory of glory of the snow. So you can imagine what this looks like in a blue carpet. It also has Puccinia in it. It has a few of the autumn crocus and a smattering of daffodils. But it's this lovely carpet underneath these dogwoods and yellow woods. We're coming up to the top of the hill where the reservoir is, but you can see how our pathways start to intersect. If we had turned on the first pathway, this is where we would have ended up but it's another view down into Rose Valley. You know, the hilliness of Highland Park is what's kept it from being developed. It was used for nursery grounds, but even then it was challenging, so it makes for a great park. So now we are at the top where the reservoir is, but I want to go all the way to the top. This is the high point of Highland Park, and this is where the children's pavilion stood, which was three stories high and gave you a view looking out towards the Bristol Hills and towards the lake. Now, the reason that John Dunbar planted lilacs on the south side of this hill is because he wanted to preserve the view from the children's pavilion down this hill. And lilacs don't get more than 15 and 20 feet on a good year. <laughs> And some of our lilacs are actually 100 years old because they come back up, they sucker up from the ground. So this is the peak of the park. And you can see there's a very large redbud. A redbud is considered a small tree, but that's a pretty good size one. This is a yellow wood. Like I said earlier, it will be coming into leaf in another few weeks. The understory are the Viburnum carlesii, which is the Korean spice bush which smells wonderful. So when you come up here, you're just invaded by this sweet aroma, and it is this series of shrubs that understory these two trees. Just to orient you, we're at the top, and down this hill there is a pathway, is our pinetum and our rock garden. If you went that way, you'd end up back where the parodia and the witch hazel are, and if you went that way, you would be in our pinetum. And many, many of the plants planted in the Pinetum came from the Elwanger and Berry Nursery and are more than 100 years old. So this is where I'm going to conclude our spring tour of flowering plants. And we'll be back this summer to show you how these plants that we've just seen beginning to come into bloom look after a few months of growth. All right. Cut. <laughs>